the Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Get some people online. See if we can tag anybody on this thing. There we go. Oh, I don't understand that. Bless you all. God bless everybody. Praise the Lord Jesus. We'll just give it a moment for a few people to start coming online with us. If you'd like to start sharing this out tonight, the Bible study, start tagging some people in that you think would benefit um, from a teaching on the book of Revelation. Uh, this evening we're going to be looking at Revelation chapter 20 and we're going to deal with the millennium reign, the thousand years on earth where Christ reigns on earth. So, um, really getting there now. So we'll give it five minutes and uh, we'll give people a chance just to come online with us and then we'll jump straight into the um, teaching this evening while I'm waiting for some people to catch up and come online with us. God bless you, Jairus. Um, I'm going to say a word of prayer and ask the Lord to bless the teaching this evening. Amen. Lord and Father, I ask you this evening, my God, that Lord, you would bless this Bible study this evening. I pray that my God this evening, as we look into your word, you would open your word up, Lord, to our minds and our hearts. You'd give us understanding, my God, of the depth of what's there, Lord, I pray. My God, I ask this evening, Lord, you'd use me as your vessel, my God, to teach your word. That you cleanse me from all unrighteousness and purify my heart, my God, that I may be a pure vessel. That you'd anoint the words I speak, my God, that, Lord, as I teach your word, that, Lord God, it would be clear. And, Lord, in context with exactly what you wanted said. Don't let me stray from truth, Lord, I pray. Keep me within the realm of truth and the lines that you've laid down, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. I pray tonight, my God, for, Lord, all those who are sick, my God, among us. I pray for those who are suffering, my God, at the moment. I pray for those who are mourning, my God, for families, my God, who are grieving out there tonight, Lord. I ask for your comfort, my God, in their people's lives, my God. And I pray you'd help, my God, for those who are brokenhearted, that you'd be there, Lord God, that did turn to you, Lord, in these times of hardship they face, Lord. So much tragedy, Lord, on the planet. I pray, my God, this evening for all the sick, my God, that are out there tonight, Lord, that may be watching this, Lord, or... My God, that will watch this, Lord, in the time to come. I ask that, my God, you would heal, my God, and deliver and set free from depression and anxiety. That you'd release our people and free them from suicidal thoughts, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for, Lord, the work that you're doing among our people. That we're seeing our people getting saved, my God, still. In these times, Lord, we see people being saved for the preaching of the gospel. I thank you, Lord, for your truth and your mercy and your kindness and goodness. In Jesus' name. Amen. So, praise the Lord. Whoever's with us now is with us, and we're gonna we're gonna get started this evening, amen. So if you have your Bible with you, you probably want a note a notepad and pen if you if you're following along to write these verses down tonight, because I'm gonna prove to you emphatically that there is a thousand year reign of Christ on the earth, um, through scripture and through you know irrefutable points. Okay, so let's take it from chapter 20 and verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, bound him for a, and bound him, sorry, for a thousand years. So... <clears throat> right off the back of what we was looking at last week in chapter 19, we saw the Lord's return last week and we saw the Lord's victorious um, conquest when he comes as a conquering king, a Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, coming back on his white horse and destroying all his enemies. We seen that last week. We seen the Lord on the earth. We see the Lord coming down to Armageddon in the north and then coming right the way up to Jerusalem. In the south and entering into the uh, Valley of Decision, Jezreel Val Valley. And then we see um, the Lord will stand on the Mount of Olives at that point and split it in two, causing a causeway, a valley. The city gates will open, the Eastern Gate, the Messiah's Gate, as the Lord goes through. And the Lord will rescue Israel, who's being trying, who the Antichrist is trying to obliterate and destroy. He will make a way for them as they cry out to the name of the Lord. They'll be saved. And God will bring Israel out. Now, the whole point in, in, in this, the, the main emphasis 
is to do with Israel and God's promise to Israel. God's deliverance of his people Israel and then all the promises in the millennium kingdom, the thousand year reign of Christ, is tied up in Israel. And for that nation, because God has not done away with these people, to understand. So <clears throat> Christ comes to earth, he conquers all the enemies of Israel and all the enemies of God's saints, his people. He destroys their enemies. And at this point, we try to piece together the bits of how this all works out. Now, we're not fully understanding every step that will take place at the coming of the Lord, what will happen when he comes back exactly. We've got... You know, we've got the overall picture, but the fine print is difficult to work out exactly what the order is of everything. But what will happen as he comes back is according to Daniel, um, according to Daniel chapter 12 and verse 11 and 12, we get an extra 75 days added to the seven year tribulation. So at the end of the seven year tribulation that week, there is a 75 day gap at the coming of the Lord. And within that 75 days, the Lord clean, cleans the earth. He restores life on the earth. He, he basically makes it habitable. Um, he, again, the Lord returning the earth to an Edenic state like Edom. Where, as he's on the earth and he brings life. With, you know, when, when the king of glory and the king of peace is on the earth. That's when true peace will, will, will be manifest. So the Lord will then reign from Jerusalem. And now I'm going to take you through a lot of different events that will take place. One of the first things that I can piece together now on my journeys through the scripture and my studies through the word of God. 21 years this year preaching the word of the Lord. Amen. Praying to the Lord Jesus. And on my journeys through my Bible, every time I find a reference to do with the millennium or the kingdom age or Christ ruling, I always write it down at chapter 20. So as you can imagine, I've had quite a few scriptures over the years that I've managed to piece together and then trying to put that together like a jigsaw puzzle to work out what, what scenario happens at the coming of the Lord has been a task of many years. I still haven't found it. It'll work it all out, but I'll do my best with you tonight on how I see these events happening. So the Lord comes to the earth. He destroys his enemies. He sets up his throne in Jerusalem. Um, at this point, within the 75 days, he builds a, a new temple is constructed. There's major alterations to the city of Jerusalem and Israel's boundaries, which we'll look at in a minute. Um, and then it says that in Isaiah 66, verse 18 and 19, it says that after that, that the Lord sends out the Jews that are saved into the Gentile nations to preach the gospel to the Gentiles who have not seen his glory. So there are still people on the earth after the second coming of the Lord who have not seen the glory of the Lord in Jerusalem. So he sends these Jewish believers out as missionaries, essentially, to the rest of the world to bring them, to bring them up to, to see the glory of the Messiah, the Saviour, which is in Isaiah 66, verse 18 and 19. Everything I say tonight, I'll back by scripture. I won't say anything without a scripture to prove what I, what, the point I make. And that's why I said it's good to have a pen for this particular study this evening. OK, so once this is done, we see that the Lord's on the earth. And the, then we see this in, ver, in chapter 20, verse one, that an angel comes down from heaven and the key to the bottomless pit or the abyss. And he takes the with a chain, he takes hold of the dragon, the serpent, which is the devil and Satan. And he chains him and he bounds him. And he's cast into a bottomless pit for a thousand years. So when Christ comes to earth, the first thing that's being removed is the influence of Satan. No more Satan for a thousand years. Praise the Lord. That's a blessing in itself. Amen. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him. OK, set a seal on him so that he should not deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. All right. So Satan's bound and cast into a bottomless pit for a thousand years when Christ rules from Jerusalem. Praise the Lord Jesus. Have you noticed it isn't even Jesus that does it? <laughs> it isn't like, you know, it isn't the Lord that has to deal with Satan. It's um, quite simple. It's just an angel. You know, some random angel just takes him, bounds him up and casts him into the bottomless pit. Now, at this point, before we start looking at the intro, the details of the millennium reign, 
I want to just talk to you about a couple of views. Um, there are different views on the millennium, on the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. Now, I believe, and Light and Life Missions, thank God, believes correctly in a pre-millennial second advent. Now, write that down if you've got a pen and paper. And what that means is that the Lord himself, when he comes back physically to the earth, which he has not done yet, when he rules on this world, will start, he will initiate a thousand years literal physical reign on the planet. He will reign from Jerusalem for a thousand years. That's a premillennial second advent. Now that's what we believe, that's what I believe, and that's the biblical view. That's supported all the way through scripture. Now, there are other views. There is amillennialism, which means no millennium, essentially. And what they believe, a miserable bunch, bless them, they believe that all the prophecy is fulfilled. Um, complete preterism holds the same thing. It comes originally from the Catholic Church. They believe that they, the church took over the blessings of Israel and that's it. It comes from the Catholic Church originally, this, this thinking, Augustinism. And anyway, they believe basically that there is no thousand year reign, that it's, uh, it's picture language, and that we're in the thousand year reign of Christ now, essentially. How that works, how is that possible? Um, because if that's the case, how has Satan been you know, bound up with all that's going on on the earth? Where is Christ in Jerusalem? When did Jesus come back? And another problem, if the Lord has come back already, which some of them teach, complete preterism teaches that, that all, all prophecy was fulfilled in AD 70 at the destruction of the temple and that there's no more prophecy to be fulfilled. Well, in that case, the second coming of the Lord is tied up with the resurrection from the dead. That's the first resurrection. So if the Lord comes and the resurrection of the dead is happened at the coming of the Lord, then we've missed the resurrection. What are we? <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Do you understand? It doesn't make sense to say that the millennium is a picture language. That it doesn't exist, that the church has replaced all that and it doesn't exist. There is another view called post-millennialism. And they believe that after the church has led the whole world into conversion, that everybody's going to get saved. And when everybody gets saved, then the Lord will come back and rule on the earth. That is kingdom now theology. That co that has been taught by prosperity preachers and people like that, that are trying to get innocent people to go and pay money into their ministries to see the whole world come into salvation. It's not going to happen. Jesus said the very opposite to that. Jesus actually said that narrow is the way and few there is that find it. Jesus said, will the Son of Man even find faith on the earth when he returns? Such is going to be the state of the world. So there are those views that I've just told you. There's the premillennial view, which believes the Lord himself will physically rule on the earth for a thousand years and start it off. That's the right one, biblically. I'll prove that with a whole host of scriptures. There's another one that believes that there is no millennium. It's a picture language, which is writing off most of the Bible. And then there's another teaching that believes after the church has led everybody into conversion, the Lord comes back. That's, that's not biblical. The Bible doesn't say that. It's the opposite of that. So these are the views. One of them is right, which will be proven right. The Lord is coming back. He will stand on the Mount of Olives and he will rule and reign for a thousand years. Satan will be bound up and cast into the bottomless pit. The Antichrist and the false prophet will be cast alive into the lake of fire. And all those who receive the mark of the beast will die at his return and await judgment at the end of the thousand year reign. These things will happen. The early church taught this as far back as you go. We understand these are the things which are ahead for the world. Amen. So Satan, <clears throat> that he may deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. And after this, he must be released a little while. I'll explain that in a bit why. And I saw thrones. And they sat on them and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads on the right hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Now, this is very simple, isn't it? I mean, it doesn't take a genius to work out this for a thousand years. 
He will rule for a thousand years. They will reign with him for a thousand years. I don't know why people have got to try and make this a picture language and say, oh, a thousand years ain't really a thousand years. What is their problem? <laughs> with Christ ruling on the earth for a thousand years. I want to rule with Christ for a thousand years. I want him to rule from Jerusalem. I want to be beside my Lord and Saviour and see Christ rule with a rod of iron. That's true government. I want to see Christ put, put away all the wickedness and injustice of this world and rule this world. I want my Lord to sit on the throne and show men what it is to live under a, a true king. Do you understand? People have a problem with this. They're, they're, they're miserable. <laughs> the world was created in seven days. Six days, the Lord rested on the seventh. We have a seven day week. It's a literal week. The Sabbath is on the seventh day. All right, so, so for the Jews, 6.30 on six o'clock on the Saturday evening. Uh, Friday evening until the Saturday evening. 24 hours. These things are in 24 hours. Every week, every month, every year is literal to mankind. When Jesus said he would die and be buried, three days later he would raise from the dead. That was three days. It wasn't a type. Jesus was hungry in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. It was 40 days and 40 nights. All right, why is it then we can take these things as literal, but when it comes to the thousand year reign, oh, it's not really a thousand years. Because the devil wants to attack the thousand year reign of Christ, the kingdom age. Because if he can attack that, he does away with the promises to Israel. You understand? And I'll show you the importance of a literal thousand year reign as we move on. I'm just going to read these few verses. I'm going to read down to six and then I'm going to show you some verses that you can mark out in your Bible, right? But the rest of the dead did not live until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So the resurrection of the godly, the resurrection of the ungodly. That's what it's speaking of. The godly raised with Christ that he's coming and rule with him and reign with him. That's the resurrection that the Bible speaks of. And then the ungodly, I, they're raised at the end of the thousand year reign. And that's to condemnation. That's to hell and judgment. That's the lake of fire. So... We'll work that through when we get to it. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. If you remember what 1 Thessalonians 4.11 says, it says when he comes back that we who are alive and remain, we caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And it says that those who have died in Christ will rise first. And they will receive their bodies first, their new bodies, as their spirit meets the new glorified body, and they'll be made complete. And we with them will meet the Lord as he comes in the air. That's 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 11. It's very, very clear about the resurrection is tied up with the coming of the Lord. Okay, now I'm not debating rapture views when anybody works out when they want to believe it, it's the pre-tribulational rapture. They believe that you want to believe it's in the middle believe it you want to believe it's post and rapture at the end believe that and you work out your resurrections as you go along that's down to you but know this for certain regardless of when you believe the rapture is going to happen the rapture is going to happen the lord is coming back there is a second coming and there is the resurrection from the dead one unto life eternally with the lord to reign with him for a thousand years and one will be to condemnation and hellfire, the lake of fire for all eternity. You know, those who have part in the first resurrection are blessed. Those who have part in the resurrection with Jesus Christ are blessed. Do you understand? Blessed and holy is the one who has part in the first resurrection over such the second death has no power. They're born again, that's why. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Do you understand? Very clear. I mean, a child would read that and say, you know what, that means a thousand years. But we have theologians that debate about it. So let's look at some stuff that will happen during this thousand years. Let's look at some of the things that will happen on the earth. Have you got pens and paper ready? Some of you are lazy Christians. You don't need pen and paper. You just got the video and you'll go back to it, won't you? <coughs> in the Old Testament, in the book of Leviticus, chapter 25 and verse 8, and throughout the book of Leviticus, we see the feasts of Israel. Now, the feasts of Israel, each feast represents a certain thing. Every feast has a point. Most of them point to Christ at Calvary and dying at the cross. Some of them have different meanings. Some have resurrection. Some have different meanings. Feast of 
first fruit, so on and so forth. But then they have a feast in Leviticus 25 verse 8 called the Feast of Jubilee or the Year of Jubilee. OK, now this particular feast, this the Jubilee isn't mentioned very much for some bizarre reason. And it's one of the most magnificent of all the feasts, because at the celebration of Jubilee every 50 years, all the land was returned to its original owners, to the families. All debts were cancelled. There was peace, joy, there was laughter, there was grace in the land. Imagine everybody that was oppressed and everybody burdened by debt was set free. Imagine tomorrow for everybody that's ever been in debt, the bank rings up and says, Jubilee, all debt cancelled. Doesn't matter if you owe us a million pound, stum, forget about it. Jubilee, it's time for joy, time for peace. All the bounds, all the bonds of life are pushed to one side. It's the Feast of Jubilee. And the, it means Jubilee is to have joy. It's the feast of joy where grace and peace reign. And it was a foreshadow of Christ ruling on the earth because you will never fully understand or fully partake in the joy that is in Christ Jesus until he actually rules, until you're in his presence. You understand how a debt is cancelled. We have jubilee through Christ, his death, his burial and his resurrection. But to have the fullness of his grace and peace isn't just in our salvation, but it's in our living with him for eternity. It's in our ruling with him. It's in our partaking in his glory and in ourselves being glorified. So this is the foreshadow of the millennium, the jubilee. It's a good study for you to go and look at. Satan is bound up at this time, as we just looked at, fulfilling Isaiah 14 verse 15. That says he would be brought down to the lowest part of the pit, Lucifer. It fulfills Matthew chapter 6 in the Lord's Prayer. We'll call it the Lord's Prayer so that everybody knows what it is. Um, it's more the disciples' prayer in Matthew 6. And you've all said it probably a million times in your life. Our Father who heart in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and so on and so forth. And you get to a point that says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And a part of that prayer is that the kingdom of the Lord would come. That is the thousand years reign of Christ on earth. That's fulfilling that prayer. God answers prayers. Amen. Thy kingdom come. In Isaiah 66 verse 11 and 12, uh, the prophet Isaiah sees that there will be great abundance and peace extended to all men as Christ rules on the earth. That the earth will bring forth so much food and, and so much produce that before men can sow seeds, the, 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 the reapers haven't finished reaping from the previous seeds. You understand, there's so much abundance that the Lord will bring, that Israel will be fruitful and fill the earth with fruit. It's going to be a joyous time, a, a, a wonderful time and the rule of Christ. In Hosea 1 verse 11, Hosea the prophet teaches us that all 12 tribes of Israel will be in the millennium. That God will bring them in, gather the children of Israel together, which he has been doing since 1948. But he will label them all. He will separate them when he comes like a shepherd does his sheep. And he will say, you're Levites, you're Ephraim, you're Manasseh, you're Judah. And he will tell each one their history and who they are which would be a um, blessing for any of us who are a bit mongrel in breed, like the gypsies, who may have Jewish heritage and don't know it. The Lord will reveal at that time who's who and who's what and where and everybody is. So the 12 tribes are not lost. God knows who they are, where they are, and they will all partake in the Millennium Kingdom and have their own land as well divided up to them. Okay. This one's a nice one. Hosea chapter 3 and verse 5 teaches us. Now we know that in the resurrection that the Old Testament, all the Old Testament saints are raised to rule with Christ in the thousand years because it's the promise to Abraham. OK, so all the saints of the Old Testament are going to come back to life and reign with us for a thousand years and those who are alive at the time with Christ. What a wonderful thing. But particularly, I'm looking forward to this. I'm looking forward to having a chat to him at this time. In Hosea 3 verse 5, it says that King David will be raised up with his sons and King David will be the priest who will serve Jesus in the tabernacle, in the temple, in the new temple. As Ezekiel says that, G that King David will be in the temple ministering to Christ and his sons 
and we will be able to have fellowship with King David and the Old Testament saints at that time. We're going to see that in a minute. I've got scriptures for that in a minute. Ezekiel chapter 40 to chapter 48. Now, you can understand that I'm only bypassing these by way of passing. I couldn't possibly try and go into depth tonight. You'd need three months to teach all this stuff. Do you understand? But in Ezekiel chapter 40 to 48, do this for yourself, we see the Millennium Temple. That there will be a temple in Jerusalem constructed by Christ. This is not the third temple that will be built that the Antichrist will sit in. Whether that's a tabernacle, a temple, whatever situation that's going to be on the Temple Mount, the Tribulation Temple, is not the same temple as the Temple, the Millennium Temple, though I've heard preachers say it is. They're mistaken. Because when you do the studying of the new temple, Ezekiel sees, the Messiah's temple, the, the um, measurements for the new temple puts the new temple complex the same size as the old city of Jerusalem presently. <laughs> it's got to be massive. It's going to be as big as old Jerusalem. And I've walked around old Jerusalem in January of last year. I can tell you it's massive. So this new, this third temple is going to be on the Temple Mount. And that's where the Antichrist and the whole scenario is going to take place. That's not the temple Christ will rule in. It's Ezekiel's temple. It's a different complex altogether. It's the size of the old Jerusalem. And you say, well, prove that, Moshi. Okay. Chapter 42, verse 15, 20 of Ezekiel teaches that. Um, now, these things have never happened yet, have they? So for people to say that, oh, it's all, it's all types. It's a picture language. There's no real thousand year reign. Christ is done with Jerusalem and Israel. The church took over Jerusalem and Israel and took the promises. What a lot of rubbish. These things have never been fulfilled yet. And they'll only be fulfilled when Christ is in the land and so is Israel. The 12 tribes by names. He will give them what he promised them through history. The land is divided up in Ezekiel chapter 40 to 48 to each of the tribes. In the new temple, there won't be a, um, there'll be no showbread or table. There's no menorah, no veil. Because Christ is the fulfilment of those things. They won't be required. There'll be no Ark of the Covenant in it. There's no mention of it. Christ is our Ark. He is the Ark of the Covenant. The promise of God is within him. Do you understand that? The sacrificial system will be restored. Even though that will be a symbolic system. They will pass over lambs and everything else will still be done. And I've had many people ask me that question. Must you, why would God bring back the sacrifice system if Christ was the final sacrifice? Well, the simple answer to that is this. Imagine at the Millennium Temple, imagine in, within the thousand years, a man takes his son and he, he goes up to Jerusalem and it's Passover time. And he brings a lamb to the temple in Jerusalem and the lamb is sacrificed. And then the father looks at his boy and he says, you see this lamb that we've just killed son that bears the mark of slaughter on it. Look in the temple. You see that man walking with the scars in his hands and feet? He did that for you. That's how he died. He is, he is the Lamb of God. It's him who this represents. So the system is put there for a memorial to bring glory to the finished work of Christ. It doesn't make save people. It's not, it's not for salvation. It's for memorial. Don't we do the same when we take our cracker and juice and we say this is, it represents the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus when we take communion? It's a type. It represents the body and the blood of the Lord. But ours is a very small scale, weak example con compared to the Millennium Temple. When they actually will have a lamb and the lambs will be sacrificed and they can point to Jesus himself and say, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, look at the, the holes in his hands and feet. He did that for you, son. He died for you, my daughter. That is the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. Past tense. So that we could live in this Millennium Kingdom. So that we could be free. So we could have peace and joy. It's all in him. So it's a, the system is set up to look back to Calvary. Where we are, we look back to Calvary. In the Old Testament, the system was looking forward to Calvary. Do you understand that? But the difference is between where we are in the millennium, the Lord himself will be there and they will see him as he is. The priesthood will be revived, um, which will be, and the, all the clothing of that through Zadok's line, because God promised that to the line of Zadok. 
Some of the, mos the mosaic laws are going to be brought back in. Some of the feast laws and stuff will be brought back in because he's dealing with Israel in the thousand year reign. That's chapter 44 of Ezekiel, 17 down to 25. You'll read which laws are brought back in. There is um, some things that will be uh, practiced among the Jews at the time. Circumcision of children will happen. The Sabbath will be enforced during the millennium reign. Israel is set apart from the Gentiles and they will only be allowed to marry their own during the millennium reign. It's interesting, um, which is in chapter 20, verse 41 and 44, verse 22 of Ezekiel. Uh, the feasts will be revived in chapter 45, verse 19. The temple um, on a high mountain, not in the city as it is now, but the city will come up out the ground, the New Jerusalem. Uh, not the Jerusalem itself, not the New Jerusalem, that, that, that comes later. Um, but Jerusalem where Christ reigns will come up out of the ground like a mountain and call, we call it Mount Zion. It really will be at that time. And all the land around Israel will be flattened when the Lord comes back. There'll be a ge geographical change. So Israel will be lifted, the mountain will be lifted up and all men will look up and they will see the Lord's temple, which will be above everything else. And from that temple, we'll see rivers of living water flowing out east of the altar down into the Dead Sea and into the Mediterranean and all them seas will bring forth life. There'll be no more death in, in the seas among the animals and fish. They'll come back alive. The Dead Sea will come alive. Men will fish in it. Um, those things are going to happen. King David and his sons will be raised up as the prince of the city. They will be given inheritances at the time. According to the book of Ezekiel, people will give one sixth of a tithe and that will be enforced at that time. Uh, living waters will flow into the Dead Sea, like I just said, and all the 12 tribes of Israel will have their land set out for them in chapter 44, verse 13 of Ezekiel. So that deals with the Millennium Temple and the situation around that. If you want more, ask me questions, inbox me, message me, and I'll, I'll, I'll answer anything that you've got to ask there. Zechariah 2, verse 5 says that Yahweh is a wall of fire around her. And that God himself will be a wall of fire around the people of Israel. They don't need walls. God will be the protection. Um, it also says in chapter 8 of Zechariah that 10 Gentiles will grab the sleeves of a Jew and say, Come, let us go and worship the Lord together. And the streets will be full of young and old. The children will be singing and dancing according to the Bible in the streets because that's what God wants to see children play. And that's what children are made for, you know, to play in the streets. That's what God loves to see the children playing. And he's going to allow that in a millennium. They will be playing in the streets and the old men will walk the streets in peace. You know, they don't need social benefits. They don't, have, they don't need pe pensions and things because Christ is reigning from the throne and he will meet all the needs of the people. You understand? The Bible says before they ask, I will answer. It says as they walk in the way that God will speak behind them and tell them the direction in which they should walk. Imagine that. As you're walking in the millennium, the voice of the Lord will tell you. He'll whisper behind you. He'll hear his voice say to you, go left. Go up there. Go to that city. Go to that town. I want you to do this. <laughs> People will be living and God will be there. It's amazing. It blows my mind. Um, in Luke 1 verse 74, Zachariah's prophecy was that God grants them that they might serve him without fear. And that's about Israel, and that will happen in the millennium. They will serve the Lord without fear at that time. Luke 19, verse 11 to 27, service is rewarded. Uh, in that, the parable, we see that the, um, we see different uh, talents given to different servants. And one man had one talent, he buried it. And for that, he was um, judged and, 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 and cast off. He sent out of darkness. And the men that used the talents were blessed. So to him who had, more was added to the faithful. And in that parable in Luke uh, 19, verse 11 to 27, we see the wicked are destroyed in the millennium. The faithless, those who won't serve Christ, who won't be obedient. Um, they're destroyed in their sin. They die. But the godly man is blessed. The faithful and those who are obedient are blessed by God. And, and even the responsibility they have, more will be given to them because of their faithfulness at that time. So there's a whole system there. Um, Matthew 19 verse 28. The 12 apostles will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes. And we see that in, in chapter 20 there where it says, I saw 
he said, I saw thrones and then we sat on them, judgment was committed to them. So that fulfills what the Lord promised the 12 in Matthew 19, verse 20, 28, minus Judas, who was destined to end in perdition, body's replacement, I believe Matthias is his name, um, will take that seat. Daniel 7, verse 13 to 14, um, shows the ancient of days giving the kingdom to the son of man that shall not pass away. The father giving the kingdom to his son is in Daniel. It's a wonderful, wonderful pre-existence of Christ. Daniel 7, verse 13 and 14. The ancient of days, God the father gives the kingdom to the son of man, which is the Messiah, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. And that kingdom will not pass away. We understand nobody will be able to destroy it. Amos 9, verse 13 says that there'll be so much provision that the plowers overtake the reapers grapes grow faster than the men can sow the seeds because the lord is on his throne and the lord provides for his people amen um it also says in amos oh actually not in amos in psalms 48 verse 1 and 2 that mount zion will be elevated there'll be geographical changes which has not happened yet the city will come out the ground of jerusalem and be elevated above the other cities in the world isaiah 2 verse 1 to 6 war will be learned no more there'll be no more war when christ is on the throne um, in psalms 89 verse 3 very important david's throne will be established as god had promised that's through christ as christ sits on the throne of his father david and rules with a rod of iron the scepter has not departed from judah according to jacob's prophecy Christ is the fulfillment of those promises. Imagine David has been given a promise by God in his life when he lived that no, that his throne would always have someone to sit on it. David is raised from the dead to see Jesus sitting on his throne. He, you know, though he is the root, he is also the offspring of David. So let me explain what this is. The root of David is he's, he's David's origin. Before David lived, Christ lived. Christ gave David life. He formed him, he called him, he chose him. He is the root of David, but he is also in his humanity, the offspring of David. He come out of David's line. Therefore, Jesus has the right to the throne of King David and the throne of Israel. And he will sit on that throne and he will rule the nations with a rod of iron. And David will look upon his own savior, his creator. And he will praise the name of God as he sits in Jerusalem and reigns. Amen. In Isaiah 4, verse 5 to 6, God covers Zion with smoke by day and fire by night. It, it rains there. There's weather conditions, according to Isaiah, chapter 4, and verse 5 to 6. And the weather gets hot. So there's seasonal weather in the millennium. Um, and God, Zion, Jerusalem, the city, is particularly where the temple is, of a day, the Bible says, that God will actually cover that with, with cloud to allow shade for the people that are going to worship because he's caring like that and at night he will cover it by fire so it's a picture of of, of, the, of the children of israel in the, in the wilderness with the tabernacle so it provides warmth for those who come by night to worship the lord you know um there will be those who want to worship god day and night there they won't be lazy christianity there will they <laughs> there'll be those who just can't keep away from jesus There'll be those who will just be so much in love with Christ that they just can't keep away from Jerusalem. That their excitement, they won't want to leave and go about their normal life and business. Every time they leave him to go and work or serve or do something they have to do, they'll yearn to go back. And night and day, God will be there. Night and day, his presence is there. And he prepares for them and cares for them and nurtures them and calls them to himself. I loved you, Jesus. I praise, praise his wonderful name. What a wonderful God we have. He's so caring towards us. Ezekiel 37, 22 is the picture of the valley of dry bones. And in that, God said to Ezekiel, he said, Son of man, he said, can these bones live? Ezekiel was wise. He said, you know, Lord. He said, command these bones to come back together, to live. And Ezekiel said, come together. And the bones rattled and they came together and it formed a skeleton. And as Ezekiel carried on watching, the sinews and tissue came upon the skeleton and the skin covered it and it became a man. And then God said, command the breath of life to enter him. And as Ezekiel commanded, the, wind, the four winds came, breathed into him and he became a living man, able to worship and praise God. 
This is a picture of Israel, who had been like the dry bones in their rebellion towards God, scattered. But God had brought them back together, 1948, into Jerusalem, again a nation in one day. They are now they're formed as a nation. They're, they're a man. The picture is they're fully, fully adorned as a man now, flesh, bones, skin and sinew as a nation. But the breath, the ruach, the breath of God, it's not in them yet because they haven't repented. They're not born again. That will happen at the coming of the Lord when they cry out for the one whom they have pierced and mourn for him. Then the breath of God will breathe into that nation and they will become a living man. And the fulfillment of what Isaiah saw in chapter 37 of Ezekiel 22 is dependent upon the millennium reign. For that living man to, to live and to worship God. That comes back together. Do you understand? It can't be types. It can't be pictures. It has to happen. For Israel's sake, it has to happen. For our sake, it has to happen. Do you understand? These things have to happen. Joel 2 verse 32. Whoever calls on the name of Yahweh shall be saved. There'll be deliverance in, Yahweh, in, in Zion. During that time, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So because people are being born there. Life will go on. Children are born. Sinful natures, Adamic, twisted natures are in, are in the thousand year reign. And those children grow up and they need to be saved. They need to call on the name of the Lord to be saved. That will be done through for the preaching of the gospel. Obviously, the gospel, the living gospel, Christ is there. They will see the pictures of Christ and his suffering through the sacrificial system that's about. As a father points to his son and says, he is the one who died for you. He is the one who died to save you. You must accept him as your Lord and Saviour. And then children will then grow up as young teenagers and, and adults that make that decision to give their lives to Christ. Nothing changes. They have to accept Christ like we do. Salvation is through faith in Christ alone. In his death, burial and resurrection alone. Nothing else. As salvation is the same for everyone. It comes the same way. And at that point, those who call upon the name of the Lord, Yahweh, Christ is Yahweh. Do you understand? God of the Old Testament will be saved. In Micah 4 verse 1 to 3, Yahweh teaches Torah from Mount Zion. That's raised up from the into the air. That's wonderful, that is. Mount Zion is lifted into the air. The city of Jerusalem and the temple on top. All the nations from miles can see it. And they can see the fire by night and the cloud by day as God rules. And the, and the living water flowing off the side of it down the, the mountain into the rivers and seas. Healing everything and making everything come alive. What a wonderful picture it's going to be in Israel encamped all around it. And the land expanded of Israel. Not that little strip of land they've got now. But the land expanded for Israel according to the promise that he gave to Abraham. Exactly what he promised Abraham. They will have the exact measurements that he gave to Abraham. Those measurements they will have. They never have received that much land ever in history. Because they've always made mistakes and they've never pursued the promise of God. But at that time the king of glory on the throne will give them exactly what he promised. They'll have all the land that he promised to Abraham. And if you see that God is in this temple, Jesus is up there in this temple, right, ruling and reigning. David is serving him. The priesthood's up there. There's holiness to the Lord up there. And the, the water of life is flowing off the side. Life is everywhere. The world's in abundance. There's no, no wickedness, no war. There's no demons. There's no devil to tempt. All that is done away with. And there's just Christ ruling. And men will come with joy in their hearts to see Christ ruling from Jerusalem. And the, the nation of Israel will be, will be laid out underneath the Mount Zion. And they will serve the Lord like Levites, like priests in the millennium. They'll have a role. All Israelites will have a role to serve. All acting as Levite priests to the rest of the nations around them. Ministering to God in Jerusalem. As the world comes up to Jerusalem. And it says that Yahweh will teach Torah. He will teach the law. He will teach his law. His moral law. From Mount Zion. You say where does it say that? Well it's in Micah 4 verse 1 to 3. In Isaiah 11 verse 6 to 16. It gives us then the conditions among the animal life on the earth. The nastiness. The anger. The bitterness. The wickedness is taken out of the earth. Out of the animals as well. Um, it's Edenic again. It's gone back to like Edom. 
like a, an Edenic state, like it was in Edom, where the lion will lay down with the lamb, the child will play with a cobra and it won't bite it. It says the child will lead a lion by his beard. You know, a parent will be sat down and they look out the window and there's his little boy walking past, dragging a lion behind him with his beard and wrestling and playing with a lion. And there'll be no violence in his kingdom. There'll be no, there'll be no wickedness. There'll be no, you know, there'll be no instinct in that animal to rip apart that child because God has taken that out. Because God's on the throne. Imagine the conditions and see these things would be wonderful. I've always wanted to play with a lion, grab a lion around the neck and have a wrestle with a lion. Um, that would be enjoyable at the time. Uh, I look forward to that, Lord. Um, in Isaiah 30 verse 21, God's voice whispers direction behind them in the way they shall go. Um, I've already explained that, that God will give direction. When people think, which way do I go? The voice of God will speak and say to them, go this way. He will tell them, he'll whisper from behind them so that he is, it's wonderful, isn't it? He never leaves us, does he? The most vulnerable part is at our back. That's the most vulnerable part we have. It's our back. And God's got our back. He gives us direction. He's behind us. There's, there's, there's nothing to fear. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, it also says in Isaiah 30, 21, you read it down, it says the moon's light will be like the sun and the sun will be seven times brighter than it is now when God is on the, we're ruling from the earth. That has never happened, but it will happen. In Isaiah 33 verse 19, the world will speak one language in the millennium reign. They will speak one language before God again. God will restore one language during that time. I've got a few more verses. In Isaiah 19 verse 18 to 25, Egypt will worship Yahweh with an altar in Egypt and they will speak Hebrew. <laughs> the Egyptians will worship Yahweh, according to Isaiah 19 verse 18 to 25. They will have an altar in Egypt set aside for the praise of God and they will speak Hebrew. In Isaiah 26, there is a song that will be sung in the millennium. And you can read Isaiah 26. Um, it's the millennium song and it says, Perfect peace for those who trust Yah. That's the name of the song. Perfect peace for those who trust Yah. It's the kingdom song. Isaiah 26. Zephaniah chapter 3, 8 to 20. God quiets Israel with his love. You know, restlessness. You know that restless heart we get. When we don't know what to do, when we turn us to and fro. It says that God quietens them with his love at that time. You know, when they're restless in their spirit because they're in the humanity still. God will, at that point, minister to them. He will speak to them and tell them he loves them. Literally. Tell them he loves them. <laughs> he will literally just speak like I'm speaking to you and say, be still, I love you. You have nothing to fear. I'm with you. Just like Jesus when he was on the earth, when he told them not to fear, that he was with them always. Well, this is the fulfillment of that. Lo, I am with you till the end of the age. And that age is at the end of the millennium. You understand? I hope you're, you know, I hope this is, Bringing some sort of blessing and, uh, and encouragement to your heart. Zephaniah chapter 3 again, 8 to 20 also says that God sings over Israel. God sings over them. You want to hear God sing? Well, he sings. Zephaniah tells us in chapter 3 verse 8 to 20, God sings and he's going to sing over Israel. He's going to sing over them. I want to hear that song to you. I want to hear Jesus singing over Israel. What will that be like to sit there and listen to Jesus singing? Amazing. And it says that he will stop all corrupt speech in Zephaniah. There will be no corruption of speech there. No, no gossip, no backbiting, no twisted tongue, no coarse joking, no filthy language. That stops in his reign. Men will have a clean tongue in his reign. Thank the Lord. Isaiah 60 verse 1 to 18 teaches the kings of the earth will bring their wealth to Israel. And bow before them. God will exalt Israel over the nations. In Acts 3 verse 21. The restoration of all things is in Christ's reign. The Bible says the creation yearns for the glorification of the sons of the kingdom. 
because within our glorification with Christ as he reigns, the earth will have its restoration. Now, the earth is going to be utterly destroyed at the end of the millennium kingdom. It's going to be a new heaven and a new earth completely. But creation yearns for Christ to come because for a thousand years, at least, it's going to be restored back to its original state under Christ's rule. That's in Romans chapter 8, verse 19 and 20. That's never happened yet, but it will. Jeremiah 3, verse 17 teaches that Jerusalem is called God's throne and no one will follow his evil heart. As God rules from Jerusalem. This has not happened yet, but it will happen. Amen. It will happen. In Jeremiah 35 verse 19, the Rechabites, <laughs> the dear old Rechabites in the Old Testament were a tribe of people that promised their granddad they would never drink alcohol. Or their great granddad. And they didn't. They stuck to it. And because three or four generations afterwards, they still stuck to the vow not to drink alcohol. God used them as an example in the Old Testament to rebellious Israel. And he said, look, he said, these people, these Rechabites, made a, a, a promise to their great, great grandfather that they wouldn't drink. And still to this day, they don't drink because of a promise, a vow they made to their great grandfather. I am God Almighty. It was a father to you and you won't, you won't obey my words. So God promises them. That there will always be a man that will stand for Jonabab, who was the, the granddad of the Rechabites, the man who made it, um, to stand for them. Always. That can only be completely fulfilled throughout the millennium. So there is a promise to these people within the millennium reign. There will be somebody standing there for the Rechabites to speak for them. <laughs> We don't even know who they are. They don't know who they are. But at that time, God knows who everybody is. And he's got all these promises in hand. Amen. This one's a shock. This one's going to blow your mind. Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah 49 verse 39. This blew my mind when I read it. Iran, Persia, modern day Iran, will be in the millennium. And they will worship God. <laughs> the Persians or the Iranians today, Iran, will be saved and they will worship God in the millennium. It has to be future. Because it never applied to its historical context. That's Jeremiah 49 verse 39. Read it for yourself. Read it for yourself. Ezekiel 34, 23. David is God's shepherd and he feeds God's lambs. King David. That's the work of King David. Um... In Ezekiel thirty six twenty seven, the Holy Spirit causes Israel to keep God's commandments. This is the fulfillment of God's promise in Jeremiah thirty one thirty one, where He says, "A new covenant I will make with them. I will no longer give them my law on tablets of stone, but I will write my law upon their hearts. They will not need anyone to teach them the law, but each man will know what is right to do because of the Lord, the Holy Spirit of the Lord that will show them." And that's in relation to Israel. That's a promise to Israel, to the nation itself. In Ezekiel 36, 27, they will keep the laws of the Lord. Luke 13, 28 and 29. Jesus said that they will come from the east, the west, the north and the south and sit with Abram, Isaac, Jacob and the prophets. Amen to that one. I love that one. You know, think about it. In the millennium, they will come, Jesus said, from the east, west, north and south, all around the, the earth. To sit down with Abram, Isaac and Jacob and have a barbecue. <laughs> to have some food and to have fellowship with them. Let that blow your mind. Sitting there with Abram, Isaac and Jacob on an Edenic earth with Christ ruling. Having a chat. And knowing who they are. I can't wait. I can't wait. And the prophets. Not just them, all the Old Testament prophets will be raised up to, to partake in the kingdom. It's a promise to them. In 1 Corinthians 6 verse 20, uh, 2 to th and 3, it says the saints shall judge the nations and the angels. That the glorified, those who have died for Christ and his witness, those who have gone to be with the Lord, those who are there and who are caught up and raptured at his coming, are given their glorified bodies in that. Those people will sit on the, well, they will sit on thrones, but they won't sit on the thrones directly with Christ as to 12, but they will be in seats of authority, as in sense, and they will judge the 
the humanity that's left on the earth for it during a thousand years not lord over them not be christ not like that it doesn't mean that it means in the context of explaining like um directing you know um counseling like counselors and we'll also judge angels <laughs> now i don't know how that works but that's going to happen um and that's in 1 corinthians 6 verse 2 and 3 Isaiah 61 verse 6, Israel functions as Levites. I've already said that. They, they work as, like, as, as the whole nation will work as Levites in Isaiah 61 6. In Isaiah 65, 20 to 25, there will be longevity in the millennium reign. His life will be extended. Um, there's a picture there of a child dies at 100. A sinner dies at 100 will be accursed. The point being the child won't die at 100 you're old but sinners will die it's my opinion right and it is just my opinion so you go and study it for yourself that the righteous don't die in the millennium there's no death for the righteous because christ is in control christ is on the throne i believe the ungodly die in judgment anybody who rejects or rebels against christ during that time will instantly die and be taken off into judgment and I believe all those who are obedient to Christ, who love God, that God will bless them. And showing kindness and mercy to generations and generations of those who love him. You understand? They will build houses, they will plant, they will enjoy their work of their hands. There will be no more miscarriage or infant death in the millennium kingdom. The Bible clearly says that in Isaiah 65, 20, 25, which will be... A, a wonderful thing. Children will play in the streets. Before they speak, God will answer. Those are some of the points, some of the bits and pieces that I found on my journeys through the Bible that I wrote down that are tied up with the Millennium Kingdom. I'm sure there's much more that I've overlooked. So study it for yourself. We're going to continue just to read the end of the chapter because we've looked at the Millennium portion. Let's just finish it now. A few more verses to read, just a quick explanation of what's going on. So then the thousand years, we're reigning with Christ for the thousand years and all these things take place. Now, verse seven, at the end of the thousand years, and when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison. Why? Because there are men on the earth and women who have the Adam, the nature of Adam, that need to choose to have a accept christ and be faithful to christ who they've served with for a thousand years or reject christ and that's part of satan's work that's what he does it says and he will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth gog and magog and gather them together to battle whose number is the sand of the sea now this isn't the gog and magog battle that we see in the book of ezekiel chapter 38 and 39 I believe that takes place before the, the tribulation period starts. It's a physical battle for Israel's wealth. I believe this is the spirit that's behind the Russia invading Israel, trying to destroy the children of God. It's the demonic being, the, the prince, the, um, the principality behind that. Do you understand? When Satan's released, I believe that this Gog, Magog, Gog is the, the ruler of Magog being Moscow in Russia. But the spirit behind that is what's gathering them together for battle. It's a wicked spirit whose number is the sand of the sea, which is heartbreaking to think that, that the people that turn against Christ, even at the end of the millennium, a thousand years reign, with a little bit of seduction from Satan, would be as many as the sand of the sea in number. To think all that they receive from Christ and they would still drive a reject Christ because of the, the, the twisted nature within them of Adam. That needs to be done away with completely. They went up the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints. Okay. And the beloved city. Now listen, this has never happened before. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. There is no battle here. There's no war. So let's get that clear. There's not going to be a battle at the end of the millennium. No more battling, no more fighting. Christ has already had the victory. But there is those who have been sieved out. There are the tares that have been separated from the wheat. And Satan has been an instrument in doing that as well. Because 
for his seduction he's shown which ones are tares and which ones are wheat. He's separating the ungodly from the godly. And to those which are ungodly are burned up with Satan in judgment. Which fulfills all the parables the Lord taught on that thing. All that the, the tears being cast into the fire, the fire and being burned up. Well, this is the climax of that. The last revolt, the last rebellion, the final one. Where God the Father says, that's it, that's enough. And fire falls from heaven and consumes them. And God says, there's no more. And everything at that point stops. The end of the millennium, we start eternity from that time. And we're going to look at the new heavens, new earth, and we'll look at that as we get to it. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. Can somebody say amen to that? And brimstone, where the beast, the false prophet, are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And here's the teaching of hell, the lake of fire, the second death. Is where men will be cast into the lake of burning fire, but ultimately be cast from the presence of God for all eternity. And listen, where God is, is good things, because God is good. And every good and perfect thing comes from the Lord. God is love, so that we experience love, it comes from God. God is peace, God is joy, God is kindness, God is goodness. These are the things the Bible teaches. God is light, in him there is no darkness at all. So if you take away God from a place, God takes his presence from a place, if God removes himself of his own free will to do that, because he ultimately gives man what they truly want, an existence without him, then you end up with a place where there is no love but the opposite. Thing, and, and it's made complete with no counterbalance. So there's just hate but no love. There's just pain but no relief in hell. There's just complete depression, anxiety. You'll want to die but can't die. There's complete fear and terror. There's nothing... To counter that because any good thing comes from God and if men reject God and the goodness of God in this life, they'll spend an eternity without it. Without without ever knowing love again or peace or joy or any of those things that God gives to men now. Those things will be taken away and they will have their place in the lake of fire for all eternity. And that's terrifying. If you've got unsaved family and friends, that should worry you. That should cause you to want to be a good testimony and to preach the gospel. Reach the lost while we can, because hell is a real place and judgment is coming upon this world. And listen, those who want to live like Satan in rebellion to God and fill themselves with pride and say, I don't need God in this life and trust in wealth, money and everything else and reject Jesus Christ as the Lord and Saviour will spend eternity with Satan in the lake of fire. It's not a party. It's a place of absolute darkness because God is light and the light is removed. Where there's no love, no no joy, nothing like that. But the fullness of pain, suffering, anguish, anger, fear, terror, depression to its fullness. You don't know what depression is. In there you'll feel depression. Anxiety. You don't know what terror is. There's no fear that you've experienced on this earth like, like that, that could be there. Because whatever you, you experience on earth can be counted by some good thing. You understand what I'm saying? If you suffer fear now... Something can come along to give you peace. You suffer hate in this world. Something can come along and show you love. There's always a counterbalance to it. But in hell, there's no counterbalance. It's the fullness of those things that mankind live in. In heaven, it's the opposite. It's the fullness of good things. It's the fullness of love. God's love, God's peace, God's joy. With no, never ever again will you experience hate, pain, suffering, anguish, tears. Nothing like that ever again. Because you'll only know the fullness of God and the good gifts that come from him. So why would you choose to rebel against God and live in eternity without him in pain and suffering when you could receive Christ and know what true love is and mercy and his grace and be surrounded with the love of God forever and all the wonderful blessings that come for those who receive Jesus. The Bible says they will be tormented night, day and night forever and ever. That's not annihilation, like the Jehovah's Witnesses would try and teach you. That, like hell doesn't exist. Hell exists. The lake of fire is real. The second death, hell and Hades will be cast into it in death. The final enemy of God. And that will be an eternal judgment. Where Jesus says there will be pain and anguish and gnashing of teeth. The worm will never die. There will always be a constant memory that I could be saved. I didn't have to be here. 
I don't have to be in this pain. But I chose this pain for my own foolishness because I rejected the gift of God, Jesus, which is eternal life. And all I had to do was accept him. That would be the pain of it all. All I had to do was accept Jesus. He didn't ask me for millions of pounds for salvation. He didn't ask me to climb Mount Everest to be saved. He didn't ask me for some ridiculous thing to save me. He asked me to believe in him. He asked me to receive him. He asked me to allow him to crucify my old life so he'd give me a new one. He asked me to lay down my old life in order that he may give me a new and better life. He wanted to swap my filthy, disgusting, sinful life for a holy, righteous, right life before God. He wanted to give me the best deal in the world and I said no. I was deceived by Satan and now I'm in the judgment with Satan. You know the frightening thing? People die every single day and there's no way in all eternity they're going to change their destiny. Wherever you find yourself when you die is where you're going to stay forever. So I'd say repent and make sure you're right with God. Because these things are not to be laughed at. Four more verses and the book's done. A chapter's done, sorry. Five more verses. Then I saw a great white throne. Him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. Judgment day. Heaven and earth flee away from him. Because of, his, because of his righteous holiness. If heaven and earth run from God because he's so holy and righteous, how will the sinner feel when they're stuck in his presence and they've got to give an account for their life before him? I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. Books were opened, another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to the works by the things which were written in the book of life. And the work that they will be judged for will be if or not. They received Jesus. What did you do about Jesus? Did you reject him or did you receive him? If you receive Christ, you become born again. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life and you can have security to know that when you die, you go to heaven. If you reject Jesus, you will, you will not see life. But you'll know the fullness of the horrors and terrors that await hell in, hell, in the lake of fire for the devil and his demons. That will be your destination if you reject Jesus. The sea gave up the dead which were in it. Death and Hades delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, each one, according to his works. Nothing escapes God. This judgment is a judgment on the wicked. It's, there's no righteous here. There's, no, there's no, no saints at the great white throne. This is a judgment for condemnation. This is, this is it. If you find yourself at this judgment seat, your destination is secure. You're going to hell and there's no way out of it. You're going to the lake of fire for eternity. You'll be bound hand and foot and cast into the lake of fire, according to the scriptures. God will say, depart from me, I never even knew you. You wicked, perverse generation. If you find yourself here, you're in trouble. You can escape this judgment by accepting Jesus. Because Jesus took the judgment on himself for all those who would receive him. So he become our substitute so that we don't have to stand before this throne and receive this judgment. He bore it on the cross at Calvary. And if you receive that from Christ, you don't have to stand in this judgment and face hell for your own sin. That sounds a good deal to me, to be honest. To receive Jesus Christ, to believe that he died for you, that he was buried and rose from the dead for you. And through that, you can be saved. That's got to be the best deal in, in the whole world ever known to mankind. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Death in a biblical sense, is separation from God. A second death, you die physically, you stand before judgment, and the second death is to be cast from the presence of God as far as the east is from the west. So imagine being trapped in hell, entrapped, I'm saying hell, but it's the lake of fire, all right? That's the final judgment. To be put into this place, this lake of burning fire, with the devil and his demons, right? In a place where there's no light, because God is light, where there's no love, joy, peace or anything like that, any good thing, because that comes from God and all that's removed. It's just a fullness of pain, suffering, darkness, anxiousness, worry, terror, hate. The place will be full of hate and bitterness and evilness because that's what's in there. And God will then take this with every wicked person, every wicked entity, every wicked spirit will be in this lake of fire. This planet or whatever it is that God has created and he will take it literally in his hand and he will cast it from himself. And for those who are in it, forever and ever 
and ever in that agony, in that blackness, in that pain and anguish, in the screaming and terror of that place, they will be forever conscious, knowing that they're drifting farer and farer and farer away from God, the source of all good things, the one whom they rejected. They will forever feel his presence getting farer and farer and farer away from them. That makes hell worse and worse and worse by every moment of eternity. It never gets better. The lake of fire will only ever get more intense and more worse as you drift far from God for eternity. You don't want to be there. You do not want that to be your destination, my friend. And I'm not trying to scare you into making a decision to follow Jesus. But if I could scare you into heaven, I would. If I could scare you out of hell, I would love to do that. But I'd prefer the Holy Spirit to convict you because God loved you so much that Jesus died for you so you don't have to go there. I'd prefer you to come to God because of the love of God that was shown to you when Jesus died on the cross. Not because you're frightened of going to hell. Don't come to God for, for, for fire insurance. They say, oh, I don't want to go to hell, so I accept God. Wrong motive. Come to God because you're a sinner and you need that you know you need to be saved and that you, 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 you're broken at the thought that Jesus would die for you, that he loved you so much that he was nailed to a cross for you, that he suffered your punishment for you, that he took hell upon himself so that you didn't have to experience it on that cross, so that if you receive him, you can be born again. Come to him for those very reasons, because he loved you first when you didn't love him. And you'll escape this place and you'll never have to feel what these souls will feel for all eternity. And you know, for millions and millions of people, it's too late. This is their future and there's no way to change it because they've died now in their sin. But for you, you're alive and you're listening to me now. You've got the chance to be saved right now. You don't have to die and go to hell. You don't have to face this judgment. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. If that doesn't frighten you, my friend, if that doesn't wake you up, I don't know what will. If you're watching this and you want to give your life to Jesus, if something I said to you tonight is, is, is struck a chord in your heart and you think, I want to be saved, inbox me. You can contact me in the Messenger, Facebook Messenger, or call me on 07782550684. Ring me and I will gladly talk with you and I will lead you to Jesus Christ and I will tell you what you must do to escape the future judgment that's coming, the wrath that's coming, to flee from that and flee to Jesus Christ. And you can partake in all the wonderful things we've looked at in the thousand year reign of Christ on this planet. God bless you this evening. I love each one of you and I pray for you. God bless you and thanks for listening. Two more chapters and we've completed the book of Revelation. Amen. We're nearly there. God bless all.